Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 30. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead, who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, to wife, and Jacob went in unto her, and Bilhah conceived and bear Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore called she his name Dan. And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, A troop cometh, and she called his name Gad. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? And wouldest thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again, and bare Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun. And afterwards she bare a daughter, and called her name Dinah. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb. And she conceived, and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go. For thou knowest my service which I have done thee. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And he said, Appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came, and it is now increased unto a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming, and now when shall I provide for mine own house also? And he said, What shall I give thee? And Jacob said, Thou shalt not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle, and all the brown cattle among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and of such shall be my hire. So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come, when it shall come for my hire before thy face, 
Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to thy word. day the he goats that were ring straked and spotted and all the she goats that were speckled and spotted and every one that had some white in it and all the brown among the sheep and gave them into the hand of his sons and he set three days journey betwixt himself and Jacob and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and pilled white stakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring straight speckled and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maidservants and men servants and camels and asses. What a story. We're following the life of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham and son of Isaac, who has fled for his life from his family because of his deceiving, troublemaking ways. And on the way to his mother's family, hundreds of miles away, north and east, over the Euphrates River, he has an encounter with God. And he arrives and falls in love with his cousin, Rachel, and agrees to work for seven years for her. Well, his uncle Laban, her father, was a bit of a trickster himself and gave him a taste of his own medicine. When that first wedding morning, when the lights are on, the sun is up, and the veil is off, he realizes he's married Rachel's older sister, Leah, and he is not happy about it. When confronting his father-in-law, his uncle, his uncle father-in-law, Laban, Laban said, well, she was older and it wouldn't be right and, uh, for her to not be married when her younger sister's married. And so... He agreed to work for another seven years, but Laban allowed him to have Rachel as his wife after Leah had him to herself for seven days. And so the first seven years of their marriage is involving Jacob working to pay the dowry, the labolo, as they say in Africa, for his uh, wife, his second wife. Now, this may seem like fingernails on the chalkboard culturally to you it may seem unchristian to you but the bible doesn't hide the ugly facts of life and everything in the scriptures are not there for us to follow there's some things in there for us not to follow why are these stories important romans 15 4 says whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Have you made a mess of your life? Stick with us today. You're going to leave here with more hope than you came with today. How can we learn from this story? Well, we're going to learn that polygamy is bad. It's nonstop drama. I did a funeral in the early days of this church for a man who ended his own life. <clears throat> the reason was he had children from seven different women and he couldn't take the drama and one day he ended it all we're not made that way when 
the story of creation in the first chapters of the Bible. It says, a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and those two will become one flesh. When you got three or four, you can't become one flesh, right? And in his case, his sister wives really were sister wives. The sisters became sister-in-laws. His wives became his sister-in-laws as well. It's messed up, isn't it? His uncle becomes great-uncle and grandfather to his children. That's messed up. You could sing that Arkansas song, He's His Own Grandpa. Have you heard that? I'll play it for you sometime during this series. This guy sings it, and it's diagrammed for you. See how it all works out. Let's see a couple other passages. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon who the ends of the ages have come. So there's some things in here to admonish us to do and some things in here to admonish us to never do. 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So our text today opens with Rachel despairing of life because her sister Leah has had four sons and she's still barren. And so in his attempt to comfort her, Jacob agrees to allow her servant to stand in for her to become the surrogate mother. His grandpa had done this with Hagar. He has a half-uncle Ishmael that's at odds with the rest of the family because of this. But, you know, some things run in the family, right? You know what to say to your kids if they criticize you? Say, well, you better pray because it runs in the family. So before it's over, he has two sons by this surrogate mother, who's now technically his wife, And then Leah pulls the same stunt with her servant girl. And now he's got four wives and two more kids. Before the chapter's over, he has 11 sons and a daughter. And so let's break into the story here at verse 14. Now Reuben went in the days of harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mommy. He's probably seven years old or six. And Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Mandrakes were believed to have um, fertility power in them, and she was desperate to have a child, and so she was going to try the mandrakes. And Leah says to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband, and now you want to take away my son's mandrakes? Can you say drama? (laughs) They were never happy at home. So Rachel said, therefore he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. She's pimping out her husband to her sister, who's also her sister-in-law. So when Jacob comes in from a hard day's work, I wonder if he became a workaholic to stay away from all the drama. Leah went out to meet him. He didn't have a chance to you know, sit down. She said, you must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night, and they conceived a child. And then later, they conceived another child. And then later, they conceived a daughter. Finally, a, a girl is born into the mix. Now, keep in mind, Leah, who's the rejected wife, is the one that's blessed with the most children. And it's through her that the Son of God comes into the world. She's in the family tree of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? He chose the rejected way to demonstrate his love for us who are rejected. And then the Lord has mercy on Rachel, and here's the 11th son. She bears a son and names him Joseph, which basically means add another one. Lord, I'm not happy. I want another one. 
And so a few chapters later, she does have another one and in fact dies in childbirth. Leaving Leah with Jacob to herself. Well, those are, those are the other, other two women too, so anyway. And nonstop family drama. This Joseph is going to suffer because of all the division. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, verse 25, you know, I've given you 14 years here, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you. And let me go, for you know my service, which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, Please stay, if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Then he said, Name me your wages, and I will give it. Now keep in mind, this guy is a trickster. What is Jacob going to do? So Jacob appears to do the humble route. The going rate, historically, was... For every five lambs born under your care, you would get one. So 20% of the increase under your care. And, but Jacob doesn't do that. He goes for less. He said, uh, you know I've served you and how your livestock have been with me. For what you had before I came was little and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed me since you're coming. Now when shall I Provide for my own house. All this stuff is yours. What about me? And Laban says, what shall I give you? And he said, you shall not give me anything. If you would do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today. Can we say today? Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. Let me have the discolored ones. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you, everyone that is not spotted and speckled among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. And Laban said, Oh, that it were according to your word. So he agrees to it, and then he pulls a stunt. Some guys have to have multi-pages in their contract because they will take the loopholes. He removes that day all the male goats that were spotted and speckled, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, everyone that had some white in it, all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them to the hands of his sons. Wait a minute, that wasn't the agreement. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. So Jacob's left with all the solid color livestock. Starting from scratch. But man's impossibility is God's possibility, isn't it? So then here's the strange thing that happens. Verse 37, Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar, and of the almond and chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods. So he makes them striped, spotted and speckled. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink so that they should conceive when they came to drink. So the flocks conceived before the rods and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled and spotted. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass whenever the stronger livestock conceived that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger, Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. What in the world? What kind of animal husbandry is that? Critics of the Bible point to this story and say that's total nonsense. But it's what happened. 
There are some explanations. You can almost hear the scriptures popping and cracking as people stretch to try to accommodate it as though it's something God told him to do. Maybe he did. We have a little bit of the inside of the story in chapter 31. He's ready to leave, and he calls Rachel and Leah and has a conversation with them. Verse 9, he says, God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream. So he has a vision. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Then the angel of the Lord spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of the land, and return to the land of your family. So Jacob had a promise that something's going to multiply with these spotted, speckled, and streaked. So what about this fence, these rods? Was the, it could have just be what it is. He did it to remind himself of the vision. Uh, he did it because of superstition. I mean, this guy wasn't a full-blown believer. He wasn't born again. Uh, there's people to this day won't go to the zoo if they're pregnant because they're afraid something will happen to the baby and the baby will come out looking like one of those animals. I mean, there's, there's superstition out there in, in the world. Stephen Wonder wrote a song, Very Superstitious, writing on the wall. So in our story, we have Jacob left with all the white sheep and basically all the black goats, solid color. You know what Laban means? It means white. <laughs> These are Laban's sheep. But invariably something happens genetically and some colored critters come into the mix. And Jacob, if nothing else, he is fencing off the solid colored animals from the speckled animals and letting the, the solid color animals inbreed or whatever. He's, he's neglecting them. That's basically what is happening. But it could be something God used if he told him to do it. Stranger things have happened. I mean, there's that brazen serpent on a pole that God told Moses to lift up and whoever looked at it would be healed of snake bite. Now we know brazen serpents on poles don't heal snake bites. You get bit by a snake and do that, you're going to die if it's very poisonous because that doesn't cure, but it's an instrument God used. I mean, the work done on the cross saves the world from their sins. What kind of foolishness is that, right? But it is a foolish act on Jacob's part, and God moved in spite of it is what I believe. If you want to believe he, he moved because of it, that's fine. Now, those that stretch things say, well, there must have been some chemicals in the wood that made the uh, animals more fertile, and so Jacob made sure the spotted and speckled ones were more fertile with these chemicals in the wood. Well, I'm not sure about that. But this is what he wound up with. Critters that were colored. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject, God blesses despite our messes. Can we say that together? He can take our lives, as messed up as they are, and use our story for his glory. He can make it look like it was his will when it wasn't his will. He can take our feeble efforts and do something great with them. He can take those weak lepers who are starving outside the city of Samaria, can amplify their footsteps to where the Samarians who've had the city under, of Jerusalem and uh, Israel under siege, they can think an army's coming their way and they flee away. So God can take our little and do great things, but he can take our mistakes, our messes, our sins, and in his hands, he can redeem. That's what redeem means, is to turn the situation around. He can do that for nations. He can do that for families. He can do that for you and me. So have hope. 
Why does God bless despite a mess? There's a famous preacher that runs around the country preaching, God don't bless a mess. And he's selling books, pushing this idea. Well, obviously it's not wise. We do reap what we sow, but God is merciful, right? Don't leave here today saying, I can just live however I want and God's going to hell. No, you, you, you're going to get some scars out of it and you'll learn not to live like that. Those the Lord loves, he chastens. So why does God bless despite a mess? Here's, here's eight reasons. God blesses with whatever he has promised. He made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And he is not a liar. His earlier visitation with Abraham, he promised him all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. He didn't see it in his lifetime, but it is a promise that stands today. Don't heed replacement theologians that will preach that this no longer stands, that God changed his mind because of Israel's wickedness. We're all wicked. We need a Savior, right? To Isaac, he said, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and to your seed, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. And to Jacob, he gives this promise. We just read it. I am the God of Bethel, the house of God, where you anointed the pillar, and where you vowed a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of thy kindred. Now, he just went to the land of his kindred. He was there. That's where his family's roots were, pre-Abraham. But he's talking about the land that I promised. This is the land of your kindred. So why does God bless this mess? Because he's true to his word. They're going to learn from their mistakes, but they are going to be blessed in the long run because God made a promise. He could have chosen someone other than Abraham and still encountered messes in life. So Abraham is just one guy he chose and sticking true to his word, demonstrating to the world, I'm a God of mercy. We used to sing a song, you're the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. You do great and mighty things. Oh Lord, I praise you and you're my God. he's made promises to you and i and he will hold true to it maybe you think you're completely disqualified because of a mess in your past hold on god is true to his word his blessings are for whomever he has promised he made promises to abraham to isaac and to jacob so his promises include the what and the where and the who Isaiah 55 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not, can we say not, It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So his promises include the what, the who, and the where, and it's because he's true to his word. Now, his word is eternal, right? For those of us that had great hopes for loved ones who've gone on to glory, The story's not over. They've just slipped into the eternal realm where his word is continuing to be fulfilled. God blesses whenever he has purpose. He has a time and a purpose, a season for everything under heaven. Can we say time? He created time for his purposes. He gives you and I 86,400 seconds every single day. What are we doing with it? 
be mindful of our time. Let God use it for his glory. There's an appointed time. Sometimes we have to be patient in the fulfilling of his word. He blesses however he has purpose. He has a way. He has a what, a who, a where, a when, and a way, a how that he purposes. We know that all things, Romans 8, 28, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called. Are there any of the called in here? According to his purpose, not my purpose, his. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So what are we predestined for? To be conformed to the image of Jesus. So how do all things work together for good? They all work together to make us more like Jesus. If we brought suffering into our own life, chaos into our own life, you can learn from that. And God in his mercy can cut your harvest of your wild oats short to make you more like Jesus. That's his purpose. His purposes will not be thwarted by anyone. There's nobody too big to stop him. Remember Haman? He built gallows to hang Jews on and wound up getting hung on it himself. The story in the book of Esther. Isaiah 14, 24, The Lord Almighty has sworn, Surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will happen. In his first sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter proclaimed, This Jesus God delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So, how was Jesus killed? He was killed according to the determined plan and foreknowledge, the counsel of Almighty God. Give him a mess, he'll use it and make it his will. He set it up. He set it up. In the law, Leviticus 24, capital punishment is registered for the sin of blasphemy. And with Jesus saying the things that he said about himself, you had no choice but either to believe or to believe that he was blaspheming and worthy of death. God set it up. Either you're going to believe in my son or you're going to want him dead and I'm going to use it for my glory and I'm going to raise him from the dead and offer redemption to the world. Turn the mess into a message, the trial into a triumph. God's manifold wisdom will be made known by us according to his eternal purpose. This is a mind-blowing scripture. It's on the plan of God that we're called to preach. Paul was called to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So these things we don't understand. Why? Why are they around? So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church, that's you and I, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. God went into great details to lay down track for his will to be fulfilled through the children of Abraham, out of whom would be born his son, the Messiah for the world. What a mess. We just read. Horrible. Strife envy, polygamy, pimping, superstition. And yet God prospers this man 
and sends him back home. He had cheated his brother out of his birthright and out of his blessing and then had to run with nothing. You cheat, you, you get nothing, right? And yet he goes back home, rich, from the hand of Laban. Why does God bless despite a mess? Because he's the God of all grace. Can we say all grace? There's no other grace that he's not God over. 1 Peter 5.10 says, The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. You may be suffering right now at the hands of someone else or at your own hand. But hold on. The God of all grace is making all things work out according to the counsel of his will just as surely as his son was destined to rise from the dead so you and I are destined to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. He's a God of all grace. And as believers, even though we're not worthy of that grace, he gives us grace for grace. I need this grace, but I'm not worthy, so he gives me grace so I can receive it. Look at this. John opens with this statement in the first chapter. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Are you discouraged today because of the behavior of others or because of your own behavior or because of mistakes that you've made or because of what you're having to reap? Are you discouraged because of what somebody else has done to you, the injustice that has to stand? Are you discouraged because the world isn't going the way you had planned? Are you you upset at yourself or mad at your world or even mad at God? I want to declare you today, God is not petty. He is mighty. Don Moen wrote a song that we used to sing. I have made you too small in my eyes. O Lord, forgive me. And I have believed in a lie that you were unable to help me. But now, O Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And in my eyes and with my song, O Lord, be magnified. O Lord, be magnified. Be magnified, O Lord, and highly exalted. And there is nothing you can't do, O Lord. My eyes are on you. Be magnified, O Lord. Be magnified. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now praying for every person in this room in need of your grace, in need of hope, faith, and love. I pray, Lord, where we have made you small in our eyes, that you'd open our eyes, and Lord, that you would magnify our perception, that we would get the big picture, that the story is not over that the mess isn't the end but we are going through it all because of you i pray lord for anyone here who doesn't know you i pray lord you'd open your eyes to the reality of the gospel that you're the savior who came and died paid the penalty for our sins and has risen from the dead so that we can receive the benefit of that amazing offering And Lord, I pray for those that are in a real tough place. I pray, Lord, you'd bring hope, light, 
life where there has been death and disappointment, Lord. Lord, where there's been condemnation, Lord, bring revelation. Where there's been perspiration, bring expiation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Live for you. Jesus, the name above.
give you and I the grace when someone makes a mistake we don't lose our minds it's not the end of the world inconvenience is not the end of the world human frailty and weaknesses is not the end of the world it can be tough I'm not belittling how people can make our lives so hard but your mistakes are not the end of the world let yourself go let Jesus be your savior and he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we can ask and think. One translation says all that we could wish for. Look at what happened to Jacob. I mean, he made the agreement to be fed in sheep and goats, right? And he became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks. That's sheep and goats female and male servants that's a staff camels and donkeys wait a minute that wasn't in the deal where was it at God blessed him God blessed him in spite of him God blessed him so that you and I would be blessed he blessed him with 12 sons so the nation of Israel could be established while being enslaved in Egypt talk about bringing something out of a man so have hope today. Don't tune out. Don't give up. Don't throw up. But look up. Lord, my eyes are on you. Set my affections on things above. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. His peace that passes all understanding. His peace that is based upon His conquest and not our compromise. His peace that lasts. In Jesus' name. Go get Him, Tigers. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today.